about a third as many people as we had on Wednesday. Go figure. Um, I do have your Scantrons here. Um, they'll be available after class. Uh, I actually forgot to add it here. The high score was 48 out of 49 because I threw out one of the questions. So hopefully people noticed that on the key. I actually didn't have a correct answer for one of the questions, which was um, rather a mea culpa as far as I'm concerned. So I just threw that one out. So um, maximum total would have been 49. We had one 48 and then quite a few 42s. So we'll just be normalizing to 42 when we get to the end of the class. Second thing that I wanted to mention as far as updates, I just updated the syllabus. I'm not sure if I've uploaded it to D2L yet, but there are a couple of changes that have happened since the last time that I posted it, mainly having to do with guest lectures. We're going to have an extra guest lecture on the 5th of June on virophages, which I think are some of the most fascinating new things to come out of the study of virology. So these are viruses that infect viruses, which is just really kind of fun, at least in my completely biased opinion. Uh, but in order to add that, unfortunately, we had to drop a lecture. And the one which I decided to drop, mostly also because I couldn't get the other guest lecturer who's really good at this, is herpes viruses, which are fascinating and interesting and wonderful. but we just don't have enough time to go over those as well. Um, the chapter in the textbook is not bad, and if people have more questions about it, I'm happy to try and answer some of those. Um, the previous year, year's lectures are available on YouTube, so if you want to go and check those out, um, those are there. Um, so what that means is we're going to have our normal schedule basically up through these next two lectures, polyoma papillomaviruses, which we'll talk about today, adenoviruses, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, and then moving the pox viruses and vaccines discussion to this Friday. Um, is that right? No. Hang on, where are we? What day of the day was? I'm so confused. That was that midterm. So today is Friday. Gee, okay. So this today, Monday will be adenoviruses. Wednesday will be pox viruses. Um, Friday of next week will be parvo and circoviruses and some of the viruses we're working on in our lab. That will be George Kaysen, who some of you know from the mutant viruses from Hell Lab is the TA. Um, this is his graduate work, so he'll talk a little bit about his graduate work and then just more general single standard DNA viruses that are infecting eukaryotes as opposed to those that are infecting bacteria. Then we have Memorial Day. I won't be here. Um, viruses of Archaea, probably the nearest and dearest my heart, although these guys are getting pretty close these days. Uh, then we'll talk about retroviruses, um, viruses of algae, and these are particularly sort of the giant viruses, and then virophages. And so the chapters in the textbook on what we'll be covering have moved a little bit as well. So you know, next two lectures, so today and Mondays, are the same. This one will have moved. This one will be the same. Um, we'll actually have some extra readings here. I'm not sure if we have those in D2L yet. I will check and make sure that that is the case. Any questions on the um, syllabus? Otherwise, you know, exams the same, et cetera. And it will just be on the materials of the air. There won't be any extra herpes virus questions on the final. OK, speaking of exams, um, there were a couple of questions that lots of people missed, which I take to be that I didn't do a good job of explaining them the first time around. But I did want to go over them in a little bit more detail. Um, first of these was question A45B39. Um, how many proteins are encoded in the H1N1 PDM09 swine flu genome? Um, that's just distraction, you know, which one it is. So any flu, um, at least the influenza A type, um, they all have 10 proteins that are encoded in their genomes. They have eight segments, but two of those segments have two proteins that they express. So these two segments here, segment 7 and segment 8, have non-structural protein 1 and 2, and matrix protein 1 and 2. Is that clear to people? So that was um, one. The next one had to do with this one, regulation of mRNA production in Ebola virus. This is most similar to regulation of which of the following, frame shifting in SARS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I was looking for is secondary structure, so changes in secondary structure. And the changes in secondary structure in RNA, the only one here that had anything to do with changes in secondary structure in RNA 
was this um, translation in Q-beta. So none of these other ones had anything to do with um, changing in secondary structures. There are secondary structures in SARS, in the coronaviruses, right at the frame shifting point, but that's not something which is regulated. It's just there. Okay. Happy questions, comments, worries? Um, and then the last one <coughs> had to do with this question. Um, if you had a mutation in the N protein in measles that bound less well to RNA than the wild type, what would you expect? Um, all kinds of different things. And I think in discussing with a couple of you about this that I probably didn't do a good job of explaining sort of how the virus senses that there's extra N protein or NP protein around, it's actually sensed by the polymerase. And that polymerase is when there's free N protein or free NP protein in some of these other viruses that's not bound to the genome. So in this hypothetical case over here where the N protein doesn't bind as well to the genome, what that means is there'll be more genome being made because the polymerase will think that it's time to make genomes instead of making subgenomic RNAs. Uh, but that's not going to change the overall amounts of proteins because that's the protein amounts are all going to be from what you have when it's regularly making those, those messenger RNAs for making virions, because those, all those subgenomic RNAs are for the structural proteins. Make sense? Yes, no? Um, this one seemed to have been particularly challenging for people. Okay, so today we're moving on to DNA viruses. So we did the RNA viruses, negative strand, positive strand. Now I want to talk a little bit about the double-stranded DNA viruses, and now these are the double-stranded DNA viruses which are infecting animals. Uh, these are, of course, the most common in bacteria. Curiously enough, there actually seem to be fewer of the DNA viruses infecting animals. Um, proportionally speaking, mostly they're RNA viruses, um, and these are DNA viruses probably because these DNA viruses, all that DNA needs to get inside the nucleus with one exception that we'll talk about a little later. Um, and that process, you know, being able to replicate in the cytoplasm and having a separated nucleus, uh, some people, in fact, have theories, who knows if they're true, that part of the reason that the nucleus evolved back billions of years ago was to actually protect the cell from being infected by viruses. Um, because that nuclear membrane actually then protected the DNA and all the DNA synthesis mach machinery from then replicating these DNA viruses. So that's a bit of an aside here. But <clears throat> the idea here with the polyoma viruses, um, these are the tumor viruses. And I put tumor viruses here in quotes. We talk about the papilloma viruses. I'll take those quotes away. But the message here is really that almost all of these DNA viruses that are infecting animal cells are going to be doing so by really tweaking the cell cycle. And so cancer, of course, is uncontrolled growth. So if you've got uncontrolled growth, how do you do that? You're kicking off the cell cycle. So a lot of what we'll talk about as far as these viruses are concerned has to do with regulation of the cell cycle. Because most cells, most of the time, are not replicating their, their genomes. These viruses are dependent on having that machinery so they need to turn on the cell cycle. A couple of other things, the packaging of the genomes here, and call these lazy viruses, I guess. Um, they have just taken over what the cell uses to package their genome, to package their own genomes. These use histones. They're basically chromatin. And this is incredibly useful when you want to study basic eukaryotic molecular biology, because you now have a well-defined, as we'll see in a second, pretty small genome, but it's bound to chromatin. It acts in a very similar way to all the rest of eukaryotic cells in terms of how they're functioning. So these are absolutely wonderful model systems. And in fact, a lot of what we know and is in all the molecular biology textbooks comes from the study of some of these polyomaviruses. And in fact, um, in one version of the textbook, they actually have things wrong. They include viral proteins in normal cellular replication. So because that's how some of them were originally found. 
the big terminology here are the T antigens. So T antigen just stands for tumor antigen. That's because when people were looking at the infected cells and what specific proteins were being made when you had cancerous growth, these were the viral proteins that you saw. And so these are the tumor antigens or the T antigens. And that's really most of the take home message about um, the SV40, the <clears throat> polyomaviruses. A uh, couple of other things that are important in terms of just the regulation, um, divergent promoters and alternative splicing. And this, uh, at least the divergent promoters, should sound really familiar, and we'll get back to that in just a second. And then one of the things we really haven't talked about has been splicing, um, because the only other DNA viruses we talked about so far have been the bacterial DNA viruses, and in bacteria you have very, very little splicing. But of course, in the case of eukaryotic, cells, you have lots of splicing. When we talk about adenoviruses, we'll even talk about the discovery of splicing, because that's the way it worked. So let's talk a little bit about where these viruses came from, then the structure, how they get in, a little bit about transcription, um, but really mostly about replication. And actually, I should the replication here is not just replication of the genome, but also changing the cell and the cell cycle um, processes. This is where all that, the tumor antigens um, come into play here. And then the release is actually pretty straightforward. So where do the polyomaviruses come from? Um, and this have this stamp quote here, not an RNA virus. Um, I should have brought my books, actually one of the things that I forgot to do. I've got these, um, as the Germans call them, hams. These you know, big, thick textbooks, um, one of which says RNA tumor viruses and the other one says DNA tumor viruses. And that was the way that a lot of tumor viruses were studied. And in fact, the first viruses that were found to form tumors were the RNA tumor viruses, which we now know to be retroviruses. <clears throat> but then relatively soon thereafter, people found these DNA viruses that could cause uncontrolled cell growth after infection. This kind of went out of favor. This was, in fact, one of the original thoughts on how cancer formed, is it was a viral infection. And the fact that people could find viruses that did lead to cancerous growth meant that people were you know, really excited, and we thought we'd be able to you know, figure out all of these viruses, and then we completely solve cancer. Of course, we have now found out that that is not the case. Uh, but this was the big interest originally, was looking at these viruses to understand cancer because most people thought that the cancers were that way. So this was very strange. The particular cancer viruses, because they weren't RNA viruses, they're a second kind. Uh, SV40, which is the one that we're mostly going to talk about today, is simian virus 40, um, was actually originally found in the polio vaccine. Um, and the reason for that is that the polio vaccine was grown in monkey cells. And very you know, huge amounts, tens, hundreds of thousands of liters worth of monkey cells. And some of those monkey cells, unfortunately, had SV40 in them. And those then were used, and you know, people with the polio vaccine actually the one were exposed to SV40. Uh, interestingly enough, there seemed to be no change whatsoever in cancer rates uh, with people who'd had SV40 and the SV40. Eventually, they figured out and got rid of it in their monkey cell lines. Um, no difference between before and after the SV40 being present there. But if you took really large amounts of SV40 and infected mice with it, you can get tumor formation. But it's really massive amounts that you have to have of this SV40 in order to get cancerous growth. And we'll see a little bit about that um, later on. But when people were studying this, because they thought it might really be causing cancer, um, they found these things like that it had a really neat genome that was packaged in chromatin, and so it turned out to be just a really wonderful tool um, for studying different viruses. The structure was also solved relatively early. Um, I have my 3D printed model up here of SV40 um, at atomic resolution, um, partly because they could get a whole bunch of it, um, getting rid of the poliovirus vaccine in there. It's about a 45 nanometer capsid. And let me switch over to my pen here. Uh, has a T equals 7 arrangement of the capsimer. So if we find our five-fold axis here, where's our next five-fold axis? 
it's going to be down here. And then to get from one to the next, you hop one, change direction, go one, two, and that's a t equals seven arrangement. So, you know, looks great, quasi-equivalent structure, but as I mentioned, this, we have a high-resolution structure, an atomic resolution structure, and the big problem with this is that all of these guys here, where do you normally see them if you have a quasi-equivalent structure? What multimerization state would these guys in the middle be? I got my new list now. So, price. Uh, since I, can't, I still can't throw it. <laughs> uh, well, we'll deal with it later. I've got another one here, too. <laughs> so, um, way back when, you know, first midterm, quasi equivalent structures, you've got pentamers at the five fold axis. What do you have in between? Hexamers. But as atomic structure, they weren't hexamers. They were all pentamers. So this is a very bizarre exception to the quasi-equivalence rules. It turns out that <clears throat> these are all pentamers. Everything is a pentamer. They're just arranged in different ways. And what that means is, is that the structure of each of the Capsid proteins, and it turns out that they're identical capsid proteins, uh, major capsid proteins. Each one is exactly the same. They have slightly different structures relative to each other in terms of all the other proteins that they're interacting with. This whole idea of quasi-equivalence is it's almost the same, and you've got hexamers and pentamers. But here, if you're at a five-fold axis of symmetry, then everything is Switch back over to this one. Does that work? Um, Five-fold axis of symmetry, they're all the same, but at each of these six folds, each of these subunits has different interactions with all of the subunits around it. So very different structure, and you know, great, wonderful quasi-equivalence works well for most icosahedrally symmetric particles, but it doesn't work. Um, in this case, and you can do all your nice T numbers, you know, T equals 6, 360 subunits, um, etc. Nonetheless, it still seems to have this beta barrel-like structure. Now instead of having a beta barrel which is flat, like we see with polioviruses, now that beta barrel is sticking up vertically, um, kind of sticking out of the structure, and then um, if you can come up and take a look here, you can sort of see where each of those is coming up and forming each of the pentamers in the structure up at the top here. So that's what's on the outside. On the inside, mentioned this before, the genome is packaged in absolutely, completely normal and boring histones. So H2A, H2B, H3, H4, um, wrapped around with 140-some nucleotides, um, and an incredibly easy way, actually, to get very large quantities of histone-bound DNA. So again, you know, reasons that people were always excited about Q-beta, Phi-X-174. It's a way of getting homogeneous large amounts of DNA. You just purify virus particles and pull the DNA out of them. Lo and behold, you have these histone-bound um, structures. So that's the way that the DNA is being packaged. Um, how does it get inside the cell? It gets inside the cell through binding to our friend sialic acid. Um, Melissa's not here, so Cameron? Yeah. yeah. So what other virus binds to sialic acid? So para, some of the paramyxos do. Where did our virus go? Somewhere in here. Anyway, don't worry about it. So I've got another one. Uh, paramyxos, anyone else? Other ones? The famous hemagglutinin. Influenza also binds to sialic acid, so very, very common virus binding, so the virus receptor. Um, these things, unlike coming in through receptor-mediated endocytosis, come in through cavili, so just another way that cells are usually interacting with the outside. 
again, these are DNA viruses, and you know this nucleosome-bound form of the genome, you know, again, looks just like the chromosomes do, so it's got to get inside the nucleus. Um, turns out that this major capsid protein, the VP1, which I forgot to mention, has a really nice nuclear localization signal on it. So that, when associated with the DNA, will pull it inside the nucleus, and then the genome is released from that VP1. Everything is good to go. What does the genome look like? The genome is, again, a relatively small genome, about 5,300 nucleotides. In this case, the other um, sorry, polyomaviruses are very similar. Um, again, double-stranded, circular, wrapped in the nucleosomes. Look at the structure. There are two divergent promoters that we have up here at the top. Um, what other system have we looked at that has divergent promoters? Um, Diana is not here. Jason, Pam, Jason, also not here. Um, Maria, anyone? Yeah. What other viruses we talked about, say, on the last midterm that have divergent promoters? Pardon? No. So these are, this would be another DNA virus. It's got divergent. So what are the other DNA virus Oops. Um, that we have that had divergent promoters? Is there another DNA virus on that last midterm? You can always toss it to someone else if you like. Who wants to answer that one? Anyone? <laughs> see, see if we can get two viruses lost in that side of the room. <laughs> exactly. So phage lambda, you know, PL and PR. So that's a um, very similar kind of system. And then you know, people used to think that was you know, where a lot of regulation was going on. Um, not surprisingly, most of the regulation happens here between these two promoters, just like the case that we have in lambda. One slightly different thing is down at the very bottom of the genome. The terminators actually overlap with each other, and that gives you double-stranded RNA. And as we all remember from our other viruses, which were in the last midterm, double-stranded RNA is generally really bad for the cell, and so the cell tries to get rid of it. So this is a way of regulating the amounts of some of these transcripts. And then what we haven't seen before are introns, um, and specifically, these are, relative to cellular introns, very short introns. And probably the fact that they're very short introns means that you can have multiple different splicing taking place because each of those splice donor and splice acceptor sites are going to be competing against each other. And because of this alternative splicing, and it's particularly true in the early genes, you end up with lots of proteins, in this case four, it's not true for all the polyomaviruses, proteins that all start with the same N-terminal sequence in terms of the protein, but then all have different C-terminal sequences. And we'll look at that um, in just a second, a little bit later on. Um, but the regulation here really seems to be that you've got short <laughs> introns, and those short introns are going to give you multiple different splicings that take place. Because the transcript, it's all starting from this early promoter right here um, that's starting to make this RNA, and then it gets spliced again inside the nucleus. Um, and then we'll talk about the late promoter um, over here. Again, earlies and lates, that should seem very familiar. Again, early proteins are mostly involved in what processes? Who's up next? Megan, I see Megan here. Um, Crystal, Alex. Yeah. yeah. So, what are the early proteins usually involved in? So, the early, so late ones are the structural ones. What are the early ones usually we've talked about so far? Yeah, important for replication. And in this case, also for changing what's going on with the cell. So particularly, these are going to be the ones, tumor antigens, which are going to lead to changing the cell cycle. So early ones, dealing with the host, 
and replication. Late ones are going to be structural. And you can even see that over here. So VP2, VP3, VP1, those are those that are fitting together to make this um, particular virion. Okay, so what's going on in this intragenic region? Again, between the late promoters and the early promoters, we have Tata boxes, um, Tata boxes for binding to the Tata binding protein. And in fact, if I remember correctly, the Tata binding protein itself was discovered by binding to these sequences in the SV40 genome uh, because it was a nice eukaryotic-like piece of DNA that people could use to study it. Uh, the other thing that was I know was discovered in SV40 was this set of sequences right here which serve as an enhancer. Um, and I'm not going to put anybody on the spot for this, but anyone remember what enhancers are for transcription, transcriptional enhancers? What are they? Friday morning, everybody's brain is empty after the midterm. Binding sites for enhancer binding proteins, because molecular biologists have no sense of humor when they come up with names. Um, so the enhancer binding protein, that's a transcriptional regulator and that is an activator that will bind to DNA and then stimulate transcription from a promoter. Now, the big interesting thing about these enhancer sequences that's really different, at least from bacteria, is that you can move them. You can move them upstream, you can move them downstream, you can put them on different pieces of DNA, um, and they still serve to activate. And so the enhancer sequence, and in fact the SV40 enhancer was the very first one of these to be discovered and discussed, had binding sites for the very first discovered enhancer binding proteins, one of which was called AP1 for activating protein 1, and we'll see that um, again a little bit later on. So this enhancer stimulates transcription from the early promoter, which you have down here, and then there are also a bunch of binding sites that overlap the Tata box this should also seem really familiar based on lambda. What happens in lambda? How do you get lambda regulation? You've got binding of proteins on top of promoters, which then block the polymerase from transcribing from there. So very same kind of thing here. Large C antigen here blocks expression from the early promoter. What does that leave? The late promoter. So large T antigen binding blocks early, and the activity is enhancer, because this enhancer is just going to work on this one, and then has this activity of the late promoters. So what's made from this early promoter? It's the early transcript. That then gets spliced, and this is where we get all of our T antigens from. So again, relatively short introns, which means that they're not always used, and the way that people know this is they actually put in extra DNA made them much longer introns, and they found that as soon as they made them to be longer introns, then only the longer introns were used and not the shorter introns. So apparently having these short introns between 50 and about 300 nucleotides um, gave you differential splicing um, for these. And again, the end terminus of these is always the same, um, up to amino acid 79. The actual number here is not critical. Um, and then at some point thereafter, you have splicing, and these splices go to different reading frames. And so they're different reading frames, you're going to end up with very different proteins. So even though they've all got the same N terminus, the C termini of these are all different relative to each other. And what are these proteins which are being made? Um, again, highly creatively, the small, medium, and large T antigens. Um, I've got these little parentheses here. Um, middle T antigen and the tiny T antigen are actually not made in SV40. Uh, so these, I would say, are less critical, and particularly this tiny T antigen, no one's really quite sure what it does. And of course, what happened here? The large, medium, and small T antigens were found. And then later they found an even smaller one. So what do you call something smaller than the small T antigen? Just you know, call it a tiny T antigen. So what are these guys doing? These, particularly the small and the medium, are exclusively involved in 
stimulating the cell cycle, just getting that cell cycle to go, and particularly when it's normally not going to be. So the small T antigen activates this thing called the MAP kinase cascade, and those of you who have had cell bi biology or are currently taking cell biology probably know the MAP kinase cascade much better than I do, but I always think about this as the MAP kinase kinase, the MAP kinase kinase kinase, the MAP kinase 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 kinase, uh, is these kinase phosphatase cascades. So you have one protein that phosphorylates the next protein which phosphorylates the next protein which phosphorylates the next protein, and eventually leads to activation of transcription, um, very often going into the cell cycle. And so in this particular case, one of the cyclins leading to, again, progression through the cell cycle. Um, here, specifically, MAP kinase, which gets phosphorylated under some kind of mitogen. And so mitogen is a you know, leading to mitosis. That's why they're called the MAP kinases. Um, mitogen activated protein kinase that phosphorylates lots of other phosphorylations that happen, and eventually you phosphorylate these transcriptional activators, which lead to expression of some of these cyclins. Curiously enough, this AP1 protein, mentioned before, the activation protein 1, first discovered, people argue about whether it's AP1 or SP1, uh, the enhancer binding proteins also is involved in stimulating transcription from those early promoters that you have in SV40, so this leads to a positive feedback loop. So, you know, here you're activating AP1. Um, how is this actually being activated? So this, the activation process that happens through the activity of the small T antigen is actually kind of like a double negative. So normally, protein phosphatase 2A will deactivate these MAP kinases. So once they're phosphorylated, that phosphate gets taken off by the protein phosphatase, and you go back to this inactive state. And this is the way that you're making sure that cell growth doesn't go completely haywire. However, in the presence of the small t antigen, it binds to this protein phosphatase. You remove the protein phosphatase, so the phosphate never gets taken off. This then continues to activate everything else in the process. So again, I like to think of this as it's, it's blocking the phosphatase, so thereby leading to activation. So that's one of the ways that you can get activation taking place, again, through these T antigens. The second of these, and not present in all polyomaviruses, but certainly present in a few, and nice review of cell biology, um, the middle T antigen basically acts like a receptor tyrosine kinase. So again, these are the cellular proteins. They're going to bind to something on the outside of the cell. Usually that causes them to dimerize. They will then phosphorylate themselves. And that phosphorylation leads to all kinds of cell proliferation. And so that's what's shown over here, oops, excuse me, on the right-hand side. Um, phosphorylation leads to more of this MAP kinase cascade, other cell signaling molecules, um, PIP3, um, and acetyl triphosphate, et cetera. But all of this is basically this tyrosine protein kinases, um, CSARC is the classic cellular one. Now the viral one, this middle T antigen, basically tricks the cell into thinking that these guys have already been activated. So second kind of activation. And then the large T antigen. And this, I could almost, you know, I like to call the, the Swiss army knife of viral proteins. Basically, if you come across a question on an exam, you have no idea what the answer is but large T antigen is one of the options, click large T antigen, because it basically does almost everything. So it's involved in replication, it's involved in regulating the cell cycle, it's involved in transcription, you know, basically anything possibly that could be going on with any of these polyomaviruses, large T is involved in that. And one way to look at that is just by starting to think about some of the different proteins that the large T antigen interacts with. One of them is the retinoblastoma protein, classic tumor suppressor. And we'll talk about how the retinoblastoma protein works a little bit later. Um, also has a nuclear localization signal. Um, it's active, again, in transcription and in replication, so it's got to get inside the nucleus. The very first nuclear localization signal to be characterized was from 
large T antigen. So um, again, um, large T antigen also binds to P53. Again, hopefully most of you heard a lot about P53 in cell biology. The reason that P53 is called P53 is it's a 53 kilodalton protein that interacts with large T antigen. So that's how P53 was originally discovered. It was a 53 kilodalton protein that interacted with a large T antigen. Um, then we have interactions with co-transcriptional activators. P300 is a classic um, histone acetyl transferase um, co-activator of transcription. Oops. Um, and oh, click through all of these. Sorry about that. Um, and then down at the bottom, we've got all of these interactions that it has with replication proteins, um, DNA polymerase alpha, the Tata binding protein. But you know, basically, you name it, large T antigen does it. Um, so it's really, again, I like to think of this sort of as the Swiss Army knife. Also, again, is involved in replication. How is it involved in replication? It's the replicative helicase that all of these polyomaviruses use. Uh, basically, it wraps around DNA, the hexameric structure, and literally pulls the two strands apart. And pulling those two strands apart then allows you to get the replication machinery to associate with it. Um, this is at the origin, the viral origin of replication. All, high, let's see, all helicases burn through huge amounts of ATP. Um, so the large T antigen is also a really strong ATP ace. Um, binds to RPA. Does anybody remember what RPA is? Again, way back when, molecular biology, forgotten all of this. Single-stranded DNA binding protein. So once you pull the two strands apart, you've got to make sure the single-stranded DNA binding protein binds, because otherwise those two strands are going to come back together. DNA pol alpha. It's DNA pol alpha. It's not the replicative polymerase. It's involved with the primase. So again. Helicase, next thing that happens, you have um, primers. And then also um, interacts with topoisomerase 1. As soon as you start to pull strands apart, you end up with topological problems because you're unwinding the DNA, um, getting lots of supercoils. You need to deal with that. The way that's dealt with is with topo 1. So how replication takes place. Um, there's an origin of replication. Again, these are circular genomes. So you just need one origin of replication. You need to have this large T antigen, which is pulling the two strands apart. And then you have RPA, binding to the single strands, Paul alpha primase, which sets down a primer and starts to replicate. And this whole process, replication forks, you need leading strands, lagging strands, et cetera. Um, so the only thing here which is viral is this large T antigen. And in fact, in some molecular biology textbooks, when you see a replication fork, it will actually have large T antigen associated with it, because this is how the very first studies were done of looking at large T antigens, how they were, say, replication, I should say. And they didn't have, actually it took quite a long time to figure out what the replicative helicase was in eukaryotic cells, um, and large T antigen did great. So you have large T antigen, and you can actually set up these experiments just with the purified DNA, again, usually SB40 DNA, um, and then all of the cellular proteins to look at cellular replication. So T antigens, everything uh, before we start talking about the late genes. Everybody happy about this? Ready to answer the clicker question on it? Good. I need a drink anyway. <clears throat> so. Which of the following does not activate a MAP kinase cascade? The small T antigen, the medium T antigen, or large T antigen? And I couldn't come up with a D or E, so don't select those. I have to find my virus. Where'd my virus go? Where'd the virion go? Oh, there it is. Got one. one of my students made it, so I can't lose this one. My daughter made the other one. I better not lose that either. 
10, <clears throat> 5. Okay, we still don't have a consensus, so tell your neighbors what you selected and why. Ready to go again? Okay, you can continue to discuss. I'll give you a minute. We had two more votes before, didn't we? <laughs> An extra clicker. There we go. One more. Ten. Five. So what did I say about whenever you have your large T as a possibility? You know, pick large T. Um, so it, again, this is even though it's a not answer. <laughs> Um, it's not directly related to any of the map kinase cascades. So, um, yes, large T is correct, and you know, small because that's directly involved protein phosphatase 2, and medium because it leads then to the <coughs> activation of the map kinase cascade. And just the way I worded this question is like, how do I come up with two other answers that actually, you know, I didn't know any other things? Not that we've, we'll, we'll get to talk about some of the other proteins later on that activate it, but none that we've talked about so far, some of the other viruses. <clears throat> what about the late transcripts? So the late transcripts, it says here no Tata box. Actually, is a Tata box, but it's not a very good Tata box. Like it doesn't have a nice B recognition element right next to it. Um, but we mentioned already the large T antigen actually suppresses the transcription from the early promoter, so you end up with the late genes all being expressed. Um, these guys also have differential splicing, but that differential splicing is not in the coding sequence. And so each of these actually has completely different sequences which are being made, VP2, VP3, and VP1. And VP1 is the major capsid protein. Um, turns out that this gets made um, a lot more than, than VP2 and, and VP, VP3. Uh, I mentioned these overlapping transcripts down here at the bottom. These then, if you end up with this you know, double-stranded RNA, that double-stranded RNA again leads to degradation of those RNAs. And what this seems to do is even though you're not getting expression from the early promoters, it also will help to degrade these, any of these leftover RNAs that happen to still be around. Um, it will also degrade these RNAs, but they're continually being made from these um, early promoters. How do you put these together? Turns out that you just make the pentamers, fit all those pentamers together. Um, they happen in the nucleus, and then that gets released, um, released out into the extracellular space. Um, the transport goes to the regular you know, extracellular transport machinery, then goes find sialic acid, gets back in. <clears throat> so what I wanted to talk about a little bit here is you know, how do you actually get tumor formation? And this will be important when we talk about the papillomaviruses in just a second here. 
So these early proteins, um, and particularly the large T antigen, but also those other T antigens as well, um, these are oncogenes. And so you can take <coughs> the small T antigen, the medium T antigen, the large T antigen, and just express them, overexpress them in some cell, and that cell will start to grow out of control. Um, and that in the absence of any of the rest of the bioproteins. But it turns out that you only end up with tumors in cells which can't replicate the viral genome. And that's probably because if you're replicating the viral genome, you know, these cells are going to end up dying and you don't have a um, replicating out of control cell that will then make more of those cells and make more of those cells and make more of those cells. If, there's, if it's permissive for virus replication, the virus is going to end up killing this actual cell. So it turns out that it's very, very rare, as I mentioned before, particularly for these polyomaviruses. If you really overload the cells with virus, you can get some tumor formation, but it's really very rare. And in the cases where it does seem to form, actually what seems to happen is it integrates into the cellular genome. There's some kind of recombination that takes place that probably gets rid of the viral proteins, gets rid of the viral origin of replication but you still have transcription of those T antigens, and that's what leads to the uncontrolled growth. So that's the, those are the polyomaviruses. I uh, want to switch gears and talk about the papillomaviruses. In terms of the structure, the binding, et cetera, um, papillomaviruses are extremely similar to the polyomaviruses, um, they've been a lot less well studied, um, and we already had this great model system, so they haven't been used as model systems, but it turns out these are actually real tumor viruses, and for a long time people actually didn't believe this, because they'd done the polyomaviruses, and you have to, as I just said, you have to really totally overload the cells, and they have had really, really infrequently, and then there's a fellow who we're probably not going to get to here later, Harold Sohausen, who got the Nobel Prize, I think a couple of years ago in medicine, um, who said, well, actually, it does look as if these really are causing cancers. And so the papillomaviruses really are cancer-causing ones. Um, they replicate <clears throat> in differentiated cells, which is also very, very strange, because usually a differentiated cell is no longer going to be undergoing DNA replication, but these are DNA viruses. You're going to be replicating in these cells, and that process of undergoing sort of de-differentiation um, is what really makes these papillomaviruses um, particularly <clears throat> important. So again, you know, very similar to the polyomaviruses, the structures, as you can tell hopefully from here, uh, look very, very similar. Again, these are all pentamers put into structures that look like they would be um, T equals 7, but there are, um, again, some of the differences, and most of those differences actually have to do with how those tumor antigens, which are not called tumor antigens, confusingly enough, um, are working, and also, again, where these are replicating. So where are the papillomaviruses originally from? They're originally actually found from warts, and again, this is just uncontrolled growth, most of them epithelial, again, many of that skin. So skin epithelia, um, warts, these are then almost always caused by some kind of papillomavirus. Um, these are infectious. Um, lots of, I think at last count, I think there were like 100 different um, papillomaviruses that have been found in humans, most of them pretty benign. Um, but, and this is where Harold Sarhausen came in, cervical cancer, and particularly the squamous cell carcinomas in cervical cancers, are directly caused by some of these papillomaviruses. Vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. We may get to that a little bit later on. <clears throat> so how do they get into cells? Um, they usually get into the basal epithelia. Basal epithelia are those of those epithelia cells that are still growing, and we'll look at these in just a second in a cartoon. Um, and then those normally, basal epithelia, will replicate, and then they will differentiate, and then the epithelia gets sloughed off like your skin. You're losing skin cells all the time. Um, how do they get in? Um, through heparin sulfate, so this is not sialic acid, um, but still also glycoproteins on the outside, you know, proteoglycans, so binding to those sugars, 
getting inside of the cell. They also interact with these integrin proteins, and so we talked about integrin proteins again way back when we talked about entry. entry. Integrin proteins bind things on the outside, help to bring them in. Not surprising that viruses do that as well. Um, it's an endocytosis process. And then after they escape from the endosome, I think they break through the endosome wall. I'm not absolutely certain about that. Um, then the early genes are turned on. And so early genes, again, these are going to be important for replication and for regulating the activity of the cell. So there are... <clears throat> Multiple you know, early genes here. Unfortunately, it's called early and late rather than tumor antigens. Um, turns out that these two in particular we'll talk about in much more detail. Um, E6 and E7 are really the major tumor antigens that you have in these papillomaviruses. Um, but instead of having divergent promoters and a regulatory sequence which is between them, again, like lambda, this is a circular genome but all the transcription is taking place on one strand. Um, that's being regulated by this locus control region right here, which binds to both cellular regulators and viral regulators. And particularly, it's this E2 protein, which is involved in binding here, and really shutting down this early promoter and allowing you to have production from the late promoter. The actual late genes are made from these late transcripts, but most importantly, there's actually regulation in terms of the poly-A tail formation. So if you have early genes, poly-A tails are made here. Late genes, poly-A tails are made here. So instead of splicing, which is what you see in the polyomaviruses and the papillomaviruses, it's really about tailing, which is giving you the, the differential regulation here. So what do we mean by um, these differentiated cells. In a normal epithelium, you've got these basal epithelia. These are actually undergoing replication all the time. You know, epithelia are some of the cell types that are always undergoing replication. So your skin cells are always being sloughed off. You're making new cells. So it makes sense from a DNA virus's point of view to actually infect the cells down here. The problem with infecting cells down here as you infect cells down here, you never have any virions being released. And so what has to happen is that these cells, which are otherwise losing their nucleus and, again, just eventually becoming dead cells, these they'll need to be alive cells so that you're producing all of these virions at the end here. Mikey, do you have a question? Okay. So when you're infected, all of these cells, in say a wart for instance, um, are still replicating and they haven't undergone these differentiation changes that you would other ha otherwise have, excuse me, um, in these later cells in epithelia. So what are all of these proteins and what are they doing? Um, L1 and L2, they're the capsid protein and the DNA binding protein. Oh, by the way, by the way they, they help encapsidate the viral DNA, but these genomes are also packaged in nucleosomes, just like you see with the, the polyomaviruses. Um, important for us are really these four proteins, E1 and E2 and E6 and E7. So E1 and E2, these basically are sort of doing the job of the large T antigen. E1 is really important for replication purposes, and E2 is really the major regulator of transcription. They end up working together, but this one mostly is replication. This one is mostly going to be important for your transcriptional regulation. Um, these guys, we don't actually really know what they're doing, um, E4 and E5. And E6 and E7, these are the ones which are kind of serving like the tumor antigens to give you the uncontrolled growth processes. So I want to talk a little bit more about E6 and E7 in terms of how they are causing this process. So we already talked about RB. RB is a classic tumor suppressor protein. But how does RB usually work? Um, RB in, <clears throat> excuse me, in a regular cell, um, the RB protein binds to these E2 factors, which are cellular transcriptional regulators that will lead to activation of the cell cycle. 
normally they are shut down because Rb is bound to these proteins. In a regular cell cycle, you have cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases that will phosphorylate the Rb protein. Phosphorylation of Rb means that it doesn't bind to E2F anymore. If you have E2F that's not bound, now it can go and go through the cell cycle, which is exactly what you have to have in terms of regular cell cycle processes. In the presence of E7, that binds to Rb. It binds to Rb better than Rb binds to E2F. So basically stimulates this progression through the cell cycle. So that's what happens with Rb binding. That's also what the large T antigen does, binds to Rb. So that's how you're stimulating the cell cycle. You're just getting rid of this block to the cell cycle. What about P53? P53 normally will block the activity of these cyclin-dependent kinases and the cyclins. So they're blocking the phosphorylation of Rb, um, blocking the phosphorylation of Rb, then you know, E2F um, goes. And then P53 does some other things as well that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but Rb is blocking E2F. You bind to Rb, you're no longer blocking E2F. And this really you know, stimulates the cell cycle. And how we're stimulating the cell cycle, if you think about the cell cycle, there's you know, G1, G2, S phase, M phase, et cetera. It's really this G1 to S phase. So gap one going to S phase. And of course, S phase makes perfect sense because it's a synthesis phase. That's where you're making all the DNA. That's where the viruses are going to want to have all of their DNA genomes being made. The other thing that happens is when one of the things that's made by these E2Fs is P53. So P53 is you know, shutting down the cell cycle, but it's also being made when you turn these things on. So what does P53 <clears throat> do? P53 does all kinds of different things. And again, it was originally discovered because it bound to the large T antigen. But the P53 protein um, can basically do two kinds of things. It can either arrest the cell cycle or can lead to apoptosis. So basically what P53 does, and what I think, what do they think they call it sometimes, the guardian of the genome. Um, so if there are problems with the genome, you either stop the cell cycle, allow DNA repair to take place, or if there's too much damage, then you go through apoptosis. So this is a regular role of P53, again, through DNA damage. E7 binds to and activates P53, you know, leading to this cell cycle arrest. E6 is actually basically sort of serving as a counter to that, where it degrades P53. <clears throat> and that degradation of P53 um, allows the cell to not undergo apoptosis and leave it in this you know, activated state. And that's probably what's leading to that lack of differentiation which takes place when you have these uh, papillomavirus-infected cells in epithelia. Happy? Yes? No? Uh, overwhelmed? Quick review of papilloma versus polyomaviruses. Quicker question. Oh, I actually give you the clicker question. That might help. Um, <laughs> which of the following HPV proteins, human papillomavirus proteins, acts most like the SV40 large T antigens in terms of transcriptional regulation? E1, 2, 4, 6, or 7. And it's not, a large T isn't one of the answers. You can't pick that one. Sounds like we need some more discussion, so 
quickly discuss amongst your friends <coughs> what you have selected and why. Ready to go again? OK. <clears throat> yeah, continue to discuss this. We've got a <clears throat> minute to go, so sorry, 40 seconds. Ten, <clears throat> five, so for transcriptional regulation, it is E2. For the replication, it would be E1. Um, and then in terms of regulation of the cell cycle, um, could be um, E6 or E7 because SP40 ends up doing both. Finish up talking about these tumor viruses. <clears throat> P53 also, as I you know, mentioned um, beginning, you know, turns on P21, which is also involved in shutting down the cell cycle. Um, but just what happens here is just like what you see in the polyomaviruses. The only time you actually end up with tumorous growth is if you're not making virus. Um, and again, very, very similar to what is <clears throat> going on with these polyomaviruses. Some of you may remember um, Henrietta Locks, the HeLa cells. Um, HeLa cells are from a <clears throat> cervical cancer cell line from Henrietta taken from her without a consent, et cetera, et cetera, a whole different story there. Um, they're transformed with E6 and E7. So E6 and E7 are stably expressed in those cells, and that leads to them being able to grow basically um, out of control more or less indefinitely. I think um, Henrietta died when in the 30s, I think. I forget all the details on this. And the cells have been continuing to grow ever since. Um, so just the, the couple of genes and overexpression there. Um, so that's a, a, one of the things that happens there. Turns out that HPV is a big issue um, in terms of cervical and anal cancers. Um, 70 million Americans are infected. Pretty much everyone's had an HPV at some point. And there are still lots of people dying from cancers um, in any given year from HPV. Almost all of this is HPV 16 and 18. I mentioned there are about 100 different ones. Um, and because of this, we've developed an absolutely wonderful vaccine that treats a number of these. Um, highly recommended for not just girls, but also boys. My two daughters have been vaccinated um, with this. Um, and uh, again, highly recommended. There was a really nice study done in Scotland very recently where the 
cases of cervical and anal cancers have gone down about 90% since they introduced the vaccine. Um, and the vaccines are really interesting. They're just the late protein, so the surface protein, expressed in a virus-like particle, so it has nothing to do with the rest of the virus. No you know, E6 and E7, so you can't get cancer from it, even though people will tell you that that's the case. Um, it's just that L1 protein um, works extremely well, so get your kids vaccinated. We'll leave it at that note, and now I do remember that it's Friday, so have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs>